Hello, everyone. This is Taya Graham. I'm your host for the Police Accountability Report here at the Real News Network. Now, before we get to today's episode, we want to give viewers a brief disclaimer. In this episode, we cover a controversial figure, Eric Brandt. He's a cop watcher and activist who we've discussed previously on this show. As we mentioned in today's episode, Brandt has become well known in the cop watching community and beyond for his activism, his controversial tactics for protesting and confronting law enforcement. As we also note in this episode, Brandt has faced legal charges for his tactics and behavior. This includes felony charges that were filed against Brandt for making violent and graphic threats against a Denver judge over the phone and on YouTube, according to court records. I want to be clear. The point of the following episode of the PAR is not to obscure or minimize these serious charges against Brandt. We fully acknowledge the severity of these charges, but as we will explain in the episode, the point of our coverage is to examine how Brandt himself, his activism, the legal charges against him, and the legal victories he has secured in court fit into a larger grassroots effort to hold police accountable in the United States. Because all these things bear directly on the issues that we here at the PAR cover on a weekly basis and the issues that civilians face on a daily basis. So thank you so much for watching and now onto the episode. Hello, my name is Taya Graham and welcome to the Police Accountability Report. As I always try to make clear, this show has a single purpose, holding the politically powerful institution of policing accountable. And to do so, we don't just focus on the bad behavior of individual cops. We also examine the underlying system that makes bad policing possible. And today, we're going to do that by talking about a man who has suffered a great deal to achieve the goal of making police more accountable, but whose tactics have prompted criticism and legal rebuke. But before I get started, I want to ask for your support. Please like, share, and comment on our videos. And if you can, take a look at the donate link below and consider becoming a sustainer of PAR. And remember, we cannot do this work without you. Now, as we've reported quite often on this show, holding police accountable is a fraught process at best. One of the reasons it is so difficult is the stranglehold policing has on the political process. As we've reported many times before, the efforts to reform law enforcement with new laws and reforms is often met with this kind of pushback. Let's listen. Forces, after final actions taken by the head of the Labor Enforcement Agency, the findings shall be provided to the public. Do you have any problem with that? No problem with that. Okay. That was a Maryland state senator during a public hearing asking for guidance on how to water down a bill that would have made police disciplinary records more widely available to the public. Let's listen again to make sure you can hear how brazen it is. It says, after final actions taken by the head of the Labor Enforcement Agency, the findings shall be provided to the public. Do you have any problem with that? No problem with that. Okay. So with this so-called intersection between policing and political power in mind, it's all the more important that we sort out both the accomplishments of and the controversy surrounding the guest who will be the topic of our show today. I'm sure many of you now have heard of Eric Brandt. He has been one of the most prolific and controversial cop watchers in a world where provocative antics and unconventional tactics are part of the norm. But what makes Eric's case so interesting and worthy of more attention is how some Sometimes an unorthodox approach can lead to unexpected results. First, let's start with some background on Eric and his entanglements with the law, and most importantly, his unique approach to holding cops accountable. Like so many so-called auditors, Eric has been known to confront police officers. The former enlisted Navy sailor has posted a variety of videos with provocative posturing that has led to run-ins like this. You need to go, you need to be quickly so aggressive. You need to be quickly so aggressive. All right, go ahead. But I need you out of this In fact, Eric most notably posted a widely circulated video that has become legendary in the cop watching community with his song, excuse my French, Happy Fuck the Cops Day. Let's listen. Greetings, Happy Fuck the Cops Day. And this approach has caused trouble for Eric, especially his threats made during coverage by the mainstream media after a court hearing resulting from one of his encounters with police. Shortly after a judge ruled against him, Eric was caught shouting threats against a judge that later led to more legal trouble. But the story doesn't end there, nor does the complexity of Eric's approach to 
asking for accountability. That's because while the mainstream media has been working hard to paint Eric as a menace to society and law and order, he has been quietly racking up court victories that have gone a long way towards holding police accountable. Brandt's story exemplifies all the contradictions of the cop watching movement and the state of policing in the country. On the one hand, you have a man who is viewed by the mainstream media as a classic bad actor, a threat to civic discourse, and a man who takes things too far to prove a point. But on the other hand, Brandt has made real progress. He has won several key cases that one could argue have cleared the way for more meaningful reform of what we can all agree is a troubled criminal justice system. First, he won a court ruling that makes it legal to stand outside a federal courthouse and inform potential journors about their right, not just to find someone innocent, but to nullify the charges. He was initially accused of jury tampering, but the case made its way all the way to the Colorado Supreme Court, where his actions were found to be constitutional. Second, after being arrested for displaying an offensive tattoo, a tattoo in the shape of a middle finger surrounded by the words, F the cops, he won a case that ordered First Amendment training for Englewood, Colorado police officers and forced the department to equip the cops with body cameras. He even got an annotation to case law governing disorderly conduct charges, expanding the range of constitutionally protected speech during protests. In fact, just recently, Eric was in court facing charges of making threats to a public official, which took an intriguing turn. So before we got to our interview with Eric, I'm joined by my reporting partner, Stephen Janis, to talk about what occurred during these unusual proceedings. Stephen, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. First, just to set the story and Eric's tactics in proper contacts, from your experience covering police reform efforts for over 15 years now, how hard is it to actually reform policing? Well, to put this in context, after the 2015 uprising and the death of Freddie Gray in police custody, um, State Senator Jill Carter introduced a series of reforms, which she had introduced five years prior, and not a single reform passed. So uh, even in the most exigent circumstances, it seems like state legislatures are controlled by the FOP, which would be the police unions, and are hesitant to make any sort of change or reform. Stephen, you have covered a lot of sentencing hearings in federal court, but what happened in Eric's case was pretty unusual. Can you talk about what you heard? Well, you know, we were listening to it, monitoring the sentencing, and when we listened to it, uh, we heard the arguments on behalf of Eric. We thought that that was his defense attorney, but in fact, it turned out to be the prosecutor. The prosecutor made a very eloquent case that Eric's work was activism, that he was trying to fight back against unjust power. So really, it was the b most bizarre um, statement by a prosecutor who is supposed to be convincing a judge to sentence Eric to an extended term or, or long term in prison, but instead was advocating for his release. Now, the controversy over Eric's inflammatory remarks raise a lot of questions about the whole idea of cop watchers being engaged in police reform. How do you put his behavior into context? I mean, I think Eric is in a long tradition of American descent, which is descent by, to a certain extent, you know, art, a descent by kind of a way of creatively showing us to take a look at something that we kind of accept for granted, but don't really understand or fathom how deeply unjust it is. People like Eric push us to look at it in a completely different light, in a completely different context. And that's what makes it so interesting. And I think in a vital form of American, um, you know, descent. Now, of course, the best way to tackle these issues is to talk to the man himself. Himself, Eric Brandt, and here he is joining us today. Eric, thank you so much for being here. So what I would like to discuss with you is some of the changes that were made to case law that caused police reform because of your arrest. And in most of the cases, you represented yourself pro se without a lawyer. So the first arrest I would like to discuss begins with you educating the public on jury nullification. And you told me that uh, lawyers David Lane and McNulty assisted you with this case, right? We were handing out literature that was published by the Fully Informed Jury Association. That's FIJA, F-I-J-A dot org. Uh, this is literature that educates people on the rights and powers of jurors. And in particular, it advises people of the power. If it's not a right, it is certainly a power that jurors have to find criminal defendants not guilty, even though the prosecution has fully met their burden according to the elements of the charge. So we were handing out literature that was pr produced by the Fully Informed Jury Association. I downloaded off of their website. I printed out about 200 copies. And we were handing this literature out in front of the Denver courthouse. And they uh, uh, came out, they arrested my friend Mark for uh, charged him with seven counts of jury tampering. 
Why they didn't arrest me at that time, I don't know. But then I sent an email to the district attorney that said exactly this. What the fuck is wrong with you people? I handed out at least as many flyers as Mr. Yanicelli, and I demand equal justice under the law. You must also charge me with seven felony counts of jury tampering. I'm so naive. I'm thinking a prosecutor's going to see this. They're going to look at this case. They're going to be like, oh, no, this is classic First Amendment situation and dismiss Mark Yanicelli's charges. I had no idea in the world that they would actually take me seriously and have me arrested and charged with seven felony counts of jury tampering. So what happened next? How did this get to the federal or Supreme Court? So other activists, Janet Matson, Eric Verlo, and, uh, and uh, Nasla McDonald, among others, I believe, filed for a federal injunction because they were so outraged at this that they too wanted to educate people coming into the courthouse. And so they filed for a federal injunction and the federal court granted the injunction and told Denver to stop arresting jury nullificationers. Well, the city didn't stop and they kept stealing our stuff. And so we moved in to the courthouse plaza and we occupied the Denver courthouse plaza for 57 days and nights before they finally pushed us off of the plaza with endless arrests that ultimately over a period of years, the city of Denver and in particular a deputy Jason Foos were found in contempt of federal court. Uh, but we hit them really hard with that. There was a huge impact. We saw a substantial increase in the number of juries that would acquit the defendants. And we also saw a substantial increase in the number of criminal defense teams willing to take cases to jury trial, knowing that we were out there educating jurors. The final note on the jury nullification is that it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court issued, a fine, issued their findings. They agreed with the district court's dismissal of our case. And they said that they make it absolute that distributing literature about jury nullification in front of courthouses in Colorado is protected speech. So the second piece of case law was set after Denver, Colorado police arrested you unlawfully because if I understand correctly, you had a statue-like creation with the F word embedded with it. Can you describe that situation for us? So it, back in June of 2014, I was just minding my own business, walking down the streets of Westminster with a giant middle finger sign that said, fuck cops. And they arrested me. <laughs> but this was an interesting one because this is one where they escalated their tactic and people call the police, People went to the police department to complain. And this was the first time that the police recognized that they had a First Amendment problem with arresting me for the sign. So they encouraged the citizens to file complaints in writing and sign the complaints. In one witness's case, they actually went to her home with the blank forms to have her sign it. And so they arrested me for walking down the street with that sign. So um, I won the criminal case on that. And then David Lane, with Kilmer Lane and Newman and Andy McNulty, his, uh, one of his associate attorneys, they filed a lawsuit back in 2016. And this suit moved forward through the courts. There were lots of delays. There was delays on both sides. Uh, and then it came up finally for a summary judgment. The summary judgment was in our favor. Uh, the city appealed that. So it went to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals. And the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals came down and said, disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace, the limiting clause that says uh, tends to incite an immediate breach of the peace, uh, that that strictly limited liability to actual fighting words. So it wasn't a matter of you being offended. It wasn't a matter of it disturbed your sensibilities. It was. It is a matter of you were compelled to an immediate reactionary act of violence to make it stop. Now I've won five federal civil rights lawsuits the most recent one was the Westminster case. This case has never come to trial, right? We filed it in 2016. Then it was finally going to come to trial last year, and my judge dropped dead of an aneurysm. So now it had to be put on another judge's docket, and it got delayed again and again and again. And then finally, with COVID, the courts have said, hey, civil trials are taking the back seat. We've got to do criminal trials first. We're backlogging them. There are time deadlines on the criminal trials. You should not expect to see a civil trial until probably January of 2022. 
So the city of Westminster, after years of fighting this case, finally said, we're all in. And uh, I, I uh, just won that lawsuit after seven years of fighting. Uh, they paid out $97,500, of which, of course, my attorney gets his probably less than fair cut. Now, I mentioned that you've suffered losses in court, too. What has been the downside or the personal cost to this activism? And is it really worth it? Uh, the downside has been that I now have a fairly lengthy criminal record because you can't win them all. Uh, not only can you not win them all because the system is certainly stacked against you, but you can't win them all because you don't always get it right yourself. So um, there have been mistakes along the way. Remember that when I started doing this, I knew nothing about what I was doing. And so I made a lot of mistakes, you know, and uh, so hopefully people can learn from my mistakes and not suffer some of the losses that I have. The losses I've, I've spent over the last seven years, I've spent about two of those years behind bars. And I anticipate that I'll probably, I am anticipating that I'll probably spend another three years behind bars. So that's really, really rough pill to swallow. The government does beat you into silence. Uh, when you look at things like how Otto the Watchdog, Winston Knowles has been treated for his basic activism, he has paid a much greater price than I have. So what other changes to case law or police reform would you like to make? If you could enact a reform policy, what would it be? What would you like to see changed in the way Americans are policed? My three primary goals, and I enumerated these many years ago, uh, my number one mission was I would like to see a constitutional amendment that mandates that jurors be advised of their right to find, of their right to judge both the law as well as the facts. Jury nullification, I think, should be codified into our constitutions, if not at the state level, at the federal level. Another thing that I've always wanted is I wanted a comprehensive body camera legislation. And um, it would appear, at least in Colorado, that this has been partially achieved. Uh, the next step is I'm a big fan of the restorative justice mechanisms. We use restorative justice in the juvenile system very regularly throughout the country, but we don't use restorative justice in the, in the adult system very much. We're really looking into possibly forming a citizen's police brutality, police misconduct uh, review board or, uh, you know, like, like MAD or something. So we're, what we're hoping is that as parts of these settlement deals or judgments in federal court, that the offending officers be required to sit through 10 sessions of people of uh, impact, of uh, victim impact boards. So that they have to sit through and listen to how a person's life was disrupted and how they were injured by the police misconduct. Now, as we've discussed before, the process of holding police accountable has ulterior motives besides just exposing the behavior of bad cops. In fact, even more important than achieving that goal is dealing with the system that makes bad policing possible. That's because, as we've explored on this show before, policing is often at the intersection of many social ills. It is often used as the enforcer of inequality to maintain the imbalance of political power and as a cudgel against the political efficacy of the masses. Which is why Eric's story is worth examining and discussing. I mean, it would be easy to dismiss a man who showed up to court in a tutu. It would be simple to disregard someone who created an admittedly offensive song called Happy F the Cops Day. I can't really argue with the fact that Eric's unorthodox style and his run-ins with law enforcement should and do in fact raise concerns, particularly when we exist in such a norm shattering moment that finds political leaders actually encouraging mob violence in an attempt to subvert our electoral process. But Eric's story also offers lessons on how we have to be equally mindful of the difficulty in reigning in an institution that has insinuated itself into so many aspects of our communal life. An institution that continues to grow in size and influence, even as other seemingly more essential forms of government, like public health, shrink. Case in point is a recent investigation in our hometown of Baltimore. Authorities here say they are probing what they termed a misappropriation of the COVID-19 vaccine by a high-ranking city police commander. The investigation stemmed from the actions of a 30-year veteran major who was not, and I'm not kidding, a member of the department's COVID task force. 
Sources say this was Major James Roden. But what makes this story more remarkable is how the details about what occurred have been handled, despite the fact that more than likely this particular incident involves doling out vaccine doses to people who apparently jump the line. And despite the allegation that this particular officer used his power to facilitate this unlawful distribution of previous vaccines during an ever more deadly pandemic, what happened next illustrates why policing is no ordinary government institution and is so hard to reform. That's because when pressed for details, a department spokesman said they could not comment because what happened was a personnel matter. That's right, a misuse of vital life-saving drugs that could determine who lives and who dies during the worst public health crisis in US history is not subject to public scrutiny. The high-ranking cop whose position of public trust gave him the ability to decide who does or who does not get a vaccine manages to avoid, at least for now, a public accounting of his actions. Let's compare those kid gloves with the treatment given to this man. His name is Steven Brandenburg, and he was a Wisconsin hospital pharmacist. Early this year, Brandenburg was arrested for allowing 500 vials of the Moderna COVID vaccine to spoil. Authorities believe Brandenburg was motivated by conspiracy theories that the vaccines were unsafe, which we should point out and emphasize there is no evidence to support. But the more important point is how Mr. Brandenburg's alleged malfeasance was handled. The hospital where he worked did not refuse to comment. Instead, they held a joint press conference with the police to fully enumerate his crimes. But the more important point is how Mr. Brandenburg's alleged malfeasance was handled. The hospital where he worked did not refuse to comment. Instead, they held a joint press conference with the police to fully enumerate his crimes. The police didn't refuse to identify him or argue he was the subject to some sort of twisted right to privacy. Instead, they did this release a mugshot which was splattered all over the internet. Moreover, they spoke openly about his bizarre motives for his crimes and promised swift and appropriate punishment. They did what the public would expect when someone abuses the public trust with taxpayer-financed, life-saving vaccines. They held the man accountable. But of course, contrast this with our Baltimore police major who has reportedly resigned from the department, but whose malfeasance has thus far been kept secret. The 30-year veteran has resigned. But of course, all that means is that despite what seems to be like a case of extremely bad behavior, this former cop will now be collecting a lifetime pension, lifetime health benefits, and all the perks courtesy of the people whose trust he violated. It is an interesting study in contrast. One man experiencing more career-ending consequences and utter public shame, and another walking away with roughly millions in benefits whose bad behavior will probably never see the light of day. One man who has his picture forever imprinted on the eternal internet, and another whose identity is actually protected by the government so that he can live freely within the fount of a publicly financed cloak of privacy. The point the entirely disparate fates of the two men accused of committing similar troublesome acts makes clear is that reforming police is no easy task to say the least. That trying to untangle the powerful web of politics and power afforded law enforcement sometimes requires an unconventional approach. That's why at the very least, we have to consider the efforts of people like Eric Brandt in the light of the challenges he actually faces, not to condone bad behavior, but perhaps to try to understand what he does and how he does it in the context of the immense and unusual power of American policing. It's a question that we all have to consider as we seek solutions to improve how we are governed, a query with no easy or simple answers, only the need that in cases like Eric, that we keep an open mind. I would like to thank my guest, Eric Brandt, for joining us today. Eric, thank you so much for your time. And I would like to thank my reporting partner, Stephen Janis, for his writing, research, editing, and reporting on this piece. Thank you, Stephen. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And of course, I have to thank friend of the show, Noli D, for her support. Thanks, Noli D. And I want you watching to know that if you have evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us and we might be able to investigate. Please reach out to us. You can email us to privately at par at therealnews.com and share your evidence of police misconduct. You can also message us at Police Accountability Report on Facebook or Instagram or at Eyes on Police on Twitter. And of course, you can message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter and Facebook. And please like and comment. I do read your comments and appreciate them. And I try to answer your questions whenever I can. My name is Taya Graham, and I am your host of the Police Accountability Report. Please be safe out there.